Hi, I'm Steve Sheldon, President of the Home Inspection Training Institute. Today, I'd like to show you how to perform a complete home inspection in accordance with the ASHE standards of practice. Keep in mind that this video assumes I've already contracted with the client to do the job, meaning that I've got a signed inspection agreement in hand. We won't be covering the inspection agreement here, but just know that's something you'll definitely want to incorporate in your business. Next, I want to emphasize that I have a very specific regimen I follow when performing the inspection. It's basically a recipe to be copied on each and every inspection. My thought process is that if I approach each and every inspection in the same manner and sequence, I'll drastically reduce the number of potential errors I can make, thereby mitigating my liability. I call this approach my inspection process. I discuss this in a little more detail in a separate video, but for now, just understand that I have a specific process I follow each and every time. So feel free to use my process if you like, but if not, just make sure you develop your own and execute it on every inspection. So assuming you have a signed agreement in hand and are ready to leave your office to visit the property, there is one other recommendation I'd make to you. That is, if you haven't already done so, Google the property online. Chances are you'll have no trouble finding it listed multiple times in the search results. If there's a listing sponsored by Realtor.com, click on that. Why am I suggesting that website? Well, I found this listing to be chock full of information about the home. Information that will give you some very valuable clues, including the age of the property. Um, and, and with age, for example, it can provide you a lot of clues relating to the components you're likely to see or not see, just based on the building standards in effect at the time the home was constructed. So, now that we're armed with some good information, let's get started. Don't forget your tools, and I'll meet you at the end of the driveway. Okay, folks, here we are at the end of the driveway of the subject property. And uh, you'll remember from our previous uh, discussion in the office, that uh, you probably would want to look this house up on Realtor.com. By doing that, you get some clues about this property that you wouldn't get otherwise. For example, I know that this house was built in 1982, which tells me that maybe this house has polybutylene plumbing, which was a problem uh, and can be a problem. It was something that was installed back in the 70s and uh, up through 1990. Um, also, you know, we'll find out whether this house, from an electrical standpoint, uh, back in that in that time frame, ground fault circuit interrupters, for example, were not required in the kitchen. So those are just some things that would be uh, red flags to us as we get started on our inspection at this house. So the first thing I want you to think about is as we move to the end of the driveway here, is to take a look around at the lay of the property. As you can see, the grading around this property is such that uh, we have pretty good water flow uh, escaping this property probably in a heavy rainstorm. It just gives us an idea, a clue as to what we can be expecting to see as we get a little closer to the property. Okay, so now that I've come up to the from the end of the driveway and checked out the house from a distance, the first thing I would do is go inside the house at this point. And to do that, I would use these, my shoe covers. I'm not gonna do that now for expediency's sake, but what I would do is go in, I'd turn the dishwasher on because I wanna get the, the dishwasher started so that I can see if uh, we have any leaks and see how it performs. The other thing I wanna do is set the thermostat. So today, it's kinda of cool outside. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set that thermostat on heat mode. So when we go inside to do the inside part of our inspection, we'll be able to check those things to make sure they're properly functioning. So back out here, the first thing that we're gonna do uh, on the outside of the home is we're gonna look at the driveway. And you'll notice that this driveway, as an example, has a number of small cracks, which are very standard on a driveway of this age. Uh, nothing to be alarmed about, but again, this is one of those things I wanna make sure that I put in my report and tell my client, especially if he's not here with me, because he's gonna see these cracks in the driveway and he's gonna say, what are all those cracks in the driveway? And if I don't bring it up first, I'm gonna get that call back from him when he gets the report, and I really don't wanna do that. So I wanna be thorough. I wanna let him know that I recognize these cracks exist and put it in the report. Okay, so here we are uh, back at the front of the home, and what we wanna do is um, we follow a process, and we're not gonna talk about the process in this video, but understand that I have an, an inspection process that I use on each and every inspection. It mitigates my liability and so forth. So 
Anyway, uh, one of the things that I need to do is I start on the left side of the house and I make my way around to the left. So I'm going to start here in, the in front of the garage doors, which are to the left of the front door. And uh, I'm going to make some notes and take some pictures of the types of siding that I have here. So for example, I have two wood garage doors. I can see that. They look to be original. Notice I have uh, cement siding. Um, I also have, uh, as, as you look up, you can see the, uh, the cedar shakes, and you can see that they're discolored. Uh, that's going to be something that I want to write up in my report, uh, because those need to be either cleaned or replaced. On newer construction, you're probably going to see a lot of metal garage doors. Uh, they really stopped making the wood garage doors. Um, and, and the reason for it is the wood, wood rots on a garage door. And uh, you can see here this house, of course, being as old as it is, you would not be surprised to see that we've got various stages of rot on the door and also over in the uh, jam. Um, again, this is just uh, something that needs to be called out and um, uh, either repaired or replaced um, as they see fit. We've now moved around to the left side of the house and um, I want to uh, point out to you some things that um, that we're going to see here. Uh, the first thing I notice is this uh, T111 siding. Um, it's, it's really kind of a plywood type siding, very popular back in the uh, time period this house was built, 70s, 80s. Um, you don't see a lot of this anymore, although you can still get it. Um, one of the problems with this, of course, is that it will over time rot, and I'll show you some examples of that later, but we do want to make sure that we, in the report, under our description of the exterior, that we, tell, that we make a note that we have plywood siding or T111 uh, siding. Uh, the other thing I notice as we go around on the on this side of the house, and I want you to get into the habit of looking up as well as down, because your inspection is more than just straight ahead. Uh, you need to be looking. Uh, so as we look at this siding, if we uh, take a look up to the upper uh, soffit, you'll notice that we have a missing part of the soffit. We also have over that gutter, we've got some uh, what looks to be drip edge flashing that looks out of place that probably needs to come down. And uh, the last thing I want you to see about up there is we have uh, the tree uh, brushing against the roof. So that's never a good idea. We want to make sure that all tree limbs and so forth are, are cut away from the house because you can imagine in a high wind situation, um, it's going to take all the granules off our roof, which will shorten the life of the roof. So as we move down further on the wall here, you'll notice that we have a window. And uh, clearly you can tell that this window is uh, in need of some paint. So we would want to make sure that we uh, call this window out that it needs to be prepped and painted. Uh, and uh, we'll keep moving. As we make our way further down the left side of this home, um, I just noticed that uh, it looks like they've poured a, a pad here. It doesn't look like it was poured when the original driveway was poured. Um, but the fact of the matter is it has several cracks in it. And um, we're going to want to make a note of that because uh, it looks like this is an area for parking another car or whatever. But um, again, it's, it's damaged. It's uh, probably not something they're going to do anything about, but certainly we would want to point it out in our report uh, that we noticed these cracks. So here we are. This is the, this is the meter box. Um, this is basically where the utility measures your power usage and uh, knows what to bill you. Um, so this is just the meter box. There's really not a lot to inspect here. Uh, I do look around the sides of the box just to see if they're properly sealed. In this case, it's not sealed, but this is such an old siding. Anyway, I think sealing it at this point would probably be uh, a moot point. But typically, you'd like to see these utility boxes sealed. The most significant thing we're going to be inspecting out here by the meter is the ground rod. And this is the ground rod right here. Um, this ground rod protects the, uh, the home from lightning strikes and power surges. So it's very important that the ground rod, it goes all the way back to our panel as far as this uh, uh, ground wire goes. And um, we want to make sure this ground wire is firmly attached to the ground rod, uh, as it is in this case. Um, and we also, these ground rods are eight feet long, and they're eight feet long for a reason. They really should be in the ground eight feet. Many times you'll actually not see you won't even be able to see where the ground wire is connected to the rod, and that's okay. In this case, we're sticking up maybe a little bit too far. Uh, I'm probably not going to write this up, especially given the fact that it's in concrete at this point. Um, but typically, uh, these things should be, you know, no more than six inches outside of the ground. If they are, uh, it's not a bad idea to write that up to make sure that we have an effective ground rod connection. 
We talked about it just a moment ago with the T111 siding, and I mentioned to you the T111 siding over time tends to rot. And as you can see here, there's a, a perfect illustration of it here under this window. We've got quite a bit of delamination going on and just general rot, dry rot. Uh, my recommendation, of course, would be uh, for them to replace the siding in this area. And given the fact that we have some other rot, they may want to just go ahead and replace all of this with the cement siding that they used on the front. As we head towards the end of the house here, I noticed that uh, it appears that they had a gate here at one time, and that gate is missing, so I want to make sure that I just make a note of the fact that the, uh, that the gate is missing from the, from the back of the house. As we're walking around to get on the deck, uh, before we got to the deck, I noticed this uh, little flagstone path or patio, and uh, you can probably just notice that uh, these flagstones are not very uh, well embedded into the, into the ground which really creates a trip hazard. So you want to be very mindful of anything that's a trip hazard uh, and call it out as a safety issue for what it is and uh, recommend that it be repaired. Okay, so now we're on the back deck and before we talk about some of the, the defects I've found with the deck, let's talk a little bit more about the outside of the home because uh, you'll notice that the exterior cladding has changed again. Uh, we now have vinyl siding, nothing wrong with that. Just uh, we want to make sure that in our report we're accurate and we can explain to people that there's more, there are multiple claddings on this home. Um, the other thing I want you to see here is you can see that we've got some rotted window sills. Um, these will all need to be replaced and repaired by a qualified contractor. Um, I also want you to see that uh, this particular outlet, I've already tested it. Um, it's not a GFCI outlet, which is a ground fault circuit protected outlet. Uh, I would prefer that it be that way, but back when this house was built, that wasn't required. But I'm still going to recommend they upgrade it um, as a safety enhancement. Uh, the last thing I noticed was the, uh, as you look at the hose bib over here, you'll notice that um, it does not have an anti-siphon device on it. Um, again, when this house was built, that was not a requirement, uh, but I would certainly upgrade that also as a, another safety enhancement. We're going to check the water pressure just to... Uh, we would, I would normally do this at the water heater, but um, because we had such a tight spot back there, um, I'm going to do it out here at this hose bib, and I know that this hose bib, based on what I could see with the plumbing, that this, this uh, piping for this hose bib has already run through the pressure regulator, so I know I'm going to get an accurate reading here as to what the actual water pressure is. By the way, just so you know for your own information, there's a difference between flow and pressure. Uh, flow uh, is really measured in gallons per minute, uh, pressure is measured in pounds per square inch. So what we're measuring is the pressure. And why does that even matter? Well, if something is uh, under higher pressure, over 80 PSI, like the fittings in toilets, dishwashers, and so forth, those things are only manufactured to withstand 80 pounds per square inch. Anything higher than that will blow out those fittings and uh, you're not going to have a very happy client if that happens. So uh, we check the water pressure, even though this is not by the way, uh, a requirement in the standards of practice. I recommend you make it a requirement in your home inspection. Uh, but anyway, we're going to turn this water on and you'll notice that the water spikes to about 110 PSI. So what I do here is I take a picture of this and um, it's going to go in my report right next to where the uh, water shutoff was. I'll have those two pictures side by side. But basically showing them that the water pressure is too high and they ought to get their, uh, normally what they have to do is get the pressure regulator actually replaced, the pressure reducing uh, valve replaced. And um, uh, it's a couple hundred dollars, but uh, it is something that has to get done every once in a while and uh, you're finding it out for them, so that's a good thing. Okay, so as we look at this deck here, it's certainly not the uh, most wonderful deck I've ever seen, but it's perfectly serviceable. A um, Couple of things I'd like to note about it is First of all, the deck doesn't look like it's been stained or painted recently. Uh, that's going to shorten the life expectancy of the deck by quite a bit. So I'd recommend that they paint or stain it. You'll actually notice in a couple of places around, uh, if you look carefully, where the wood has started to bow, which is just a sign that the deck hasn't been treated uh, and the wood is, is starting to uh, dry out. Um, another thing I want to notice about this deck, and I don't typically carry one of these tape measures with me, um, and the reason I'm doing it today is just for your benefit because as I look at these pickets on this deck railing, 
I noticed that they're probably large enough in space to allow a child to fall through, which is kind of a safety issue. Uh, you'll notice that when I do go and measure this, that they are exceeding four inches. It's five inches. Um, you know, will I call that out? I probably would make a note of it in my report. The reason I wouldn't make a big issue out of it is this deck is pretty much at grade level. So a child is probably not going to get hurt if they get in between those pickets. Uh, but if this deck were eight or ten feet off the ground, then that would be a totally different matter. So just keep that in mind. So here's an example of the uh, pier blocks that we were talking about earlier. And uh, the fact is that pier blocks are really not the permanent solution uh, to support a deck. And even though this deck's at grade level, it's my recommendation that these pier blocks be removed and the deck be, uh, the deck be embedded, the columns be embedded in concrete. That's the proper way to do it. I know Lowe's and Home Depot sell a lot of these. That doesn't make it right. Uh, over time, the, the ground underneath those pier blocks will erode. And as a result, uh, the, those deck posts won't be supported by anything. Uh, that's why the pier blocks are really not a good alternative. All right, so we finished our deck inspection, and I noticed that we get to the back door on the deck. These are the French doors that lead out to the deck. Uh, this is called uh, a door jam right here, and you'll notice that this is all rotted out. Uh, it also is on the other side of the door as well. Um, very common thing to have happen because uh, what happens is water flows down the surface of the trim, and then it has nowhere to go but sit at the door jam where it typically rots it out. This is a pretty simple repair, but it's something you certainly wouldn't want to miss on a home inspection, so make sure you call it out. The last thing I wanted to show you on this deck is uh, where, we, where the deck is at grade level, and this is a really good illustration of it here. Uh, you can see that we have uh, the deck right there against the, uh, the grade, and uh, you can see that some of the deck isn't even visible, which means it's uh, under the grade and it's going to be rotting. And uh, that's going to severely uh, uh, affect the lifespan of the deck. So always want to make sure that uh, the decks are, are not built at grade level, even though they're using pressure-treated lumber. It doesn't matter. Pressure-treated lumber will also rot over time. One of the things required in your inspection report is noting any retaining walls uh, on the property that could adversely affect the, the structure. Uh, while this retaining wall here that we have at the back of the home is really not impacting the structure directly. It does impact the deck and it's probably just a good idea to call it out. Um, it seems to be in decent shape. Uh, one footnote about retaining walls that you should know is retaining walls are not designed to hold back water. They're only designed to hold back soil so it's very important. With this particular wall it happens to be pavers and uh, those are fine, landscape pavers. You'll notice that the actual drainage for these pavers is done in the seams. So we, we are not holding water back or allowing water to release itself. If this were a solid concrete wall, we better have weep holes in it, something to allow the water to pass, but keep the dirt behind. Okay, um, just uh, a, a note of uh, something you need to keep an eye out for as you're walking around the backs and the sides of the home. Uh, this is a downspout and um, you know it may look fine to you initially and, and it does look fine, but you'll notice if you walk up to it and knock it a little bit, you notice that it's not connected, so always a good idea to have these things strapped, as well as um, when you're around the foundation, uh, it's a good idea to have a downspout extension on these to keep the water flowing away from the foundation and not back towards the house, so I'd recommend a downspout extension here as well. In addition to retaining walls, the standards of practice require that you note any fencing on the property and what it's made of. You can see here that we have a stockade fence and uh, actually we have some damage to the fence. If you look over here, over my shoulder, you'll see the, the slats that are damaged. Also this uh, post right here, looks like this fence could come down on us at any moment. So we're gonna get out of the way and we'll write this down in our inspection report. We're over at the right rear corner of the house right now and uh, I was waiting to see when we would see it, but this is the outdoor condensing unit. This provides the air conditioning for the house. And uh, this outdoor unit, um, there's only one of them, which tells me that we probably are only dealing with one furnace inside, or we are dealing with one furnace inside. Um, so uh, what I want you to know about this is, uh, first thing is we're, we're going to just visually examine the unit, make sure that it's nice and level. Uh, if this were not level, we'd certainly want to make sure we write that up. 
This one happens to be a, a nice level unit. We're going to get the name off the unit. It's a Weather King. Um, you can't see that from the video, but it's right here on the top of the unit. Um, you'll also notice that we have a disconnect box, which is behind the unit. This disconnect is here so that someone who wants to work on the unit with maybe the owner's not home, they can come back here and they simply can get uh, into a disconnect, which actually is, uh, just kills the power to the unit. This is not the circuit breaker. The circuit breaker is inside at the panel. This is simply a disconnect so that somebody can safely work on this without worrying about somebody turning the power back on while they're out here and uh, giving them a zap of their life. So, uh, you know, we don't need to pull this out or anything. I was just showing you how that, how that looks. Um, the, the one thing I would note about this disconnect is that this box really uh, is required to have 36 inches of workable space behind it without this unit blocking it. So you can see here that kind of difficult if I wanted to work on this with this unit here, this really should probably be located a little further away from the unit. I'm probably not gonna make a big deal out of it here. Um, but uh, I just wanted to let you know that uh, that's the, the electric uh, code is a requirement that these, that these boxes be located uh, in a workable space away from the unit. Uh, the last thing, and mo probably the most important thing about this, um, is the label. And uh, with the label, uh, you need to be aware of the fact that uh, you're going to need to take a picture of that. And then from that label, you're going to get all kinds of information, like the model number, the serial number. In this particular uh, unit, they actually have the manufacturer's date on it. Um, so let's go over those real quickly. The Weather King is the manufacturer. The date of manufacture was June of 2002. The model number will help us to determine the tonnage of the unit, and you need to provide in your report the tonnage of the unit. So how do we determine tonnage? Well, if you look in that model number, there should be a number in that, uh, in that model number that is divisible by 12. So if you look here, you see that we have 36 divided by 12 is 3. So this happens to be a 3-ton unit. And typically, you would find that the age, if it weren't listed here like it is on this particular unit, it would be in the serial number. And the best way to determine that is to go to a website, www.building-center.org, find the serial number on this unit that most closely resembles the serial number that you're going to get on that website, and that'll tell you which digits in this number would represent the year. As I mentioned to you on this unit, it, it's just plainly on the label, but most of the time you're going to have to look at, uh, into buildingcenter.org or learn who the manufacturer is to figure out which digits represent the year. Uh, that's the important thing you need to know. One final note on this air conditioning unit, by the way, is you'll notice all this uh, cable wire or whatever it is. I really don't know what this is, um, but I would simply make a note of it in my report uh, to know that there's all this excess wire over here and it probably needs to be identified and or removed. It looks like at one point somebody added this little storage shed to the uh, exterior of the home. It's adjacent right there to the, to the uh, interior of the home. But um, anyway, what I wanted you to see here is uh, they had some termite damage in here and you can just see that uh, as evidenced by, uh, by the mud on this kind of a sheetrock uh, substance here. And what happens is the termites, of course, they, they embed themselves in these mud tunnels. And, uh, of course, this would need to be treated. So I would call, call this out for sure to make sure that they understood that there was uh, evidence of termite damage and that a pest control company needs to further evaluate and repair as needed. Uh, the other thing I want to show you is the dryer vent against this back wall. Um, you can see that it's not connected. So... Uh, just something that uh, would need to be done at some point, and I'd make sure that you note that also in your report. Okay, now we're around the right-hand side of the house, and I just wanted to point this out to you because this is something you're gonna see quite often, and that is, this is where a gas meter, the gas line enters the structure, and you'll notice here that uh, we don't have any sealing going on around here, so water, insects, uh, bugs, et cetera, can get in behind the siding, and that's never a good idea, so always make sure that any opening around a utility line like this or whatever it might be, a vent line, that it's uh, caulked and sealed real good so water can't enter the structure. Right next to that uh, gas line we were just looking at a moment ago, uh, you'll notice this siding here. They call this delamination. Uh, this is where the siding starts to peel apart 
and um, of course when it gets to that point it's in uh, very bad shape and of course this just needs to be replaced um, also note the around the window the window frame you see that we've got a lot of rot here um, again not painted uh, in this particular house at this particular house I'd probably in the report say something along the lines of several of the windows around the home uh, have lost paint and are rotting recommend that those uh, windows be uh, repaired or replaced as needed okay we're back to the front of the house and uh, we're just to the right of the front door so we're almost finished with our exterior inspection a couple of things I wanted you to note on this uh, on this front porch um, we've got some I don't know what you whether these are wasps or what kind of insect that is but um, I certainly would want to make sure that I call that out for removal um, also uh, this outlet right here um, is pretty loose and it needs to be better secured to the house uh, something else I noticed is, is right up here uh, with the soffit uh, looks like it's starting to deteriorate uh, has rotted a little bit and there are also some uh, what we call bore bees that have drilled into the uh, fascia board and those things are very annoying so I, I just go ahead and call them out that they need to be sealed and treated by a pest control company and uh, the last thing it, it may be a small thing to some people but uh, I do like to test the doorbell and in this case you can see doorbell doesn't ring doesn't work so I want to make sure I write that up and include that in my report as well uh, one thing that's worth noting is uh, we have a crack in the uh, pour out here for the front porch and it's um, probably doesn't show up very well in the video but it's a not a it, it's a fairly decent sized crack um, I think it's probably been here a long time it doesn't look like anything that's very recent um, the, the reason I wanted to make sure I point this out to you is a you want to make sure this makes it into your report I would just call it out as something that needs to be monitored over time but the real thing I want you to be aware of as a home inspector is that this house is on a slab and I want you to make I want to make sure you understand that this is not part of the slab of the home uh, that is inside this front door this is a separate pour and this is for the front porch exclusively so this is more of a uh, of an aesthetic thing um, than it is anything to be really concerned about although somebody might not like the fact that they have a fairly large crack outside their front door but you want to make a note of that it's not a serious issue just something you want to point out okay now we've come inside the garage and basically the garage is the last part of our exterior inspection and um, so one of the things we want to test, and I'm not going to do it in this video, but I do want you to know that you need to do it. And we want to test the garage doors to make sure that they're functioning correctly. These particular uh, garage doors do have automatic openers installed. So to test an opener, um, there's actually a sensor on the floor. And uh, those light sensors uh, are what uh, activate the door to retract. And so it's very important for safety reasons that that door retract either when those sensors are triggered by a foot or a, you know by by a car or child or whatever would trigger those doors to go back or the other option is that that door would retract under pressure so if you were to hold that door it should immediately retract one of those two uh, needs to be in place for those garage doors to be safe if they're if they're automatic garage doors so this is what a sensor looks like uh, we have two garage doors, so that sensor is to the other door. This sensor uh, is lined up with another sensor at the other end of this door. And uh, we're not going to actually test the door here, but to, to just let you know, the sensor, what should happen is if anything gets in the way of this while the door is closing, then the door will automatically retract. That's the whole point behind it. Um, and what's interesting is you want to make sure that these sensors are mounted no more than six inches above the floor. Okay, because I've actually seen them on inspections where they're mounted way up here because the homeowner clearly just doesn't understand what they're for. They're for safety, okay, especially child safety. We don't want those things too far up off the floor where a child could get underneath that while the door is closing because uh, that wouldn't be a good situation. So anyway, that's what the sensors are all about. Uh, the next thing we're going to look at in this particular garage is uh, you'll notice that we have a lot of... Uh, peeling uh, on the surface of the ceiling so the um, looks like they had uh, some sort of uh, I won't, not popcorn but um, it's eluding me at the moment but anyway the the uh, finish has come off probably gotten wet at one time um, we'd want to make make a note of that 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 just simply needs to be um, you know repaired uh, appropriately 
Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to head into the furnace room because that is just off the garage and we'll cover that uh, next. Well we have a utility room in this garage and uh, you'll note that um, in a utility room uh, because it's part of the garage we're going to do this part of the inspection next. It also happens to house the uh, furnace and the water heater for this home. So we're going to be inspecting those at the same time we're here in the garage. One of the things I want you to note um, just right off the bat, you can't see this, but I can, and that is that these, both of these appliances are gas appliances that are inside this uh, enclosed uh, area. And you'll notice that this is a sliding door, and because of that, there is no ventilation openings here to ventilate uh, those two items. So we really want to make sure that there is proper ventilation allowing enough uh, air in there to operate those appliances correctly and prevent any dangerous situations from occurring. Okay, so we're inside that little uh, utility room and um, we're going to inspect the furnace now because that's where we are. Um, so the first thing I like to do is, in this case, you can hear the furnace is running at this point uh, because I had gone in earlier in the day and turned the heat on, okay, because I want to, I'm going to check that later when we go inside. But um, in order for me to do a, a, a better inspection of this furnace, the first thing I really need to do is I need to turn it off. And every furnace should have a kill switch. And it doesn't really matter where that kill switch is located as long as it's within the proximity of the furnace. Uh, but you want to be able to turn that off. That's also so somebody could work on the unit uh, without having to necessarily uh, pull the breaker, turn the breaker off. Okay, so we normally have a cabinet just like this. We've got a top cabinet and uh, we have a bottom cabinet. Um, the burner compartment is, is, is down here. Um, actually, it's up here. Um, what I wanted to show you, though, is um, you need some information off of this unit. So if you look closely, it happens to be on this side, but again, it's going to be similar to the air conditioning unit outside. You'll have to take a picture of that. Uh, that information will give you the manufacturer, um, and uh, it'll also give you... Um, Really, that's all you need to know is the, the manufacturer and the date. Okay, those are the two things on a furnace. Uh, the other thing you need to check on a furnace is we want to check the filter. In this particular case, the filter's down here. And here's the door for the filter. And you'll notice that this filter is nice and clean, pretty much. There's a little bit of dust in there, but this house is being worked on at the moment, so I'm not too concerned about it. But understand that, you know, that filter does need to be cleaned. About every 30 days to 60 days, they recommend you change a filter. Um, they've made this one really easy. Um, I wish I could tell you that all uh, furnace filters will be this easy to get to, but uh, they're not. This one happens to be uh, the exception, but you'll notice that this fits back in here like that and then I can just I can just lock it into place with these little clasps. Um, I always recommend too that the filters to my clients that they get this kind of gauge filter um, something a little sturdier than uh, they, they sell these other paper filters that are really flimsy and uh, yeah these cost a little bit more but they're well worth it because they'll be easier to remove and replace when they need to. Um, the other thing I want to show you is I'll turn this furnace back on. I turn, the, I turn the furnace off to check the filter, and the reason I do that is if I leave the furnace running when I'm trying to pull that filter out, that fan's going to be running, and it's going to be pulling me, and it's going to be pulling that filter, and I've had times where I've actually pulled the filter out, and it doesn't look like a filter anymore when I've gotten done with it, so save yourself the hassle. Just turn the, turn the unit off, and then turn, just make sure you turn it back on uh, before you leave. Um, this particular unit, it may not come back on because you'll notice that this button here makes this idiot proof, so I have to put that on there first. This door just fits right on there, and you'll notice the unit comes on now. Then I can take the top door, and before I put the top door back on, I'll let this unit fire up because I'd like you just to see what you can of the burners. You'll see a nice blue flame in there. And that's going to tell you that the furnace is really operating at, at proper capacity or proper uh, uh, efficiency is when that, that, that flame is blue. If that flame were orange or dancing around, 
uh, that would probably tell me that this furnace uh, is old, has a cracked heat exchanger maybe. Uh, it needs to be definitely investigated by a qualified contractor uh, if that's the case. But you'll see here a nice blue flame and uh, that just tells me that it's clean and working good. Uh, I would expect that because I think as I looked on this date, this is a 2013 unit. so. Uh, it's, it's a fairly new unit. These typical life expectancy on one of these units would be 20 to 25 years. So this looks like it's been well maintained. Looks like it's in good shape. Uh, the next thing I want to show you, probably the last thing on this furnace, is just to understand that these are uh, vent pipes. And these vent pipes get incredibly hot. And uh, you'll notice how they put this metal shield here. Uh, that's a B vent right there. A B vent is a double walled vent. And that's good because it, it makes that outside wall of the vent a little cooler. But they needed to put this here because we need to have at least one inch between a B vent and any combustible material. If we had a single walled vent, we need six inches. So just keep that in mind. What they've done here is they've, they've attempted to uh, protect the wall. And you'll notice here, they even protected this pipe from, that's coming from the water heater they protected it from this ductwork because that's also combustible. So uh, that all looks pretty good. Um, and uh, with that being said, we'll move over here to the water heater. Water heater, just a, a couple of things I want to note um, that I noticed here. First of all, you probably wonder what this is. This is actually the condensate line. Uh, the evaporator coil for the outdoor unit actually sits behind this sheet metal. There's nothing for you to inspect. I just want you to understand that there's a tremendous amount of condensate in the summer when you're running that air conditioning unit that comes out of this condensate line and then this typically runs to the outside which it does in this case okay so i just wanted you to know what that was this here is the gas line that services the furnace and i am a little concerned about this and the reason i'm concerned about this is you probably can tell from from looking at it that this this pipe has been kind of crammed in here in between the water heater and the furnace and now that, that line is no longer perpendicular uh, or is no longer you know, straight up and down. So um, that's really going to put a lot of pressure on the pipe, potentially cause a gas leak. So I want them to come in here and just uh, rearrange this. This is also kind of loose. Um, the other thing I want to just note to you is all gas appliances, whether it's a furnace or a water heater, um, it requires this, which is called a drip leg. And notice how the gas is coming through this line and it changes 90 degrees to go into that furnace, which is what it's supposed to do. The drip leg catches the impurities in the gas and drips, they, they, they fall into this uh, leg of the pipe. And actually this can be removed at some point if it needs to be to, to, to remove those flakes that might build up, those impurities that might build up in the gas. So that's what one of these is for. Um, and uh, every, like I said, every gas appliance should have one of those. Uh, one other note I'll make, this is the CSST, they call it CSST, Corrugated Stainless Steel Tubing. You'll see this a lot. It's very distinct, it's yellow, um, and um, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, I'll let you read more about it. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's important that this be grounded to the electrical system. That's not your job to figure that out if it is. I simply, whenever I see this uh, CSST, uh, uh, piping, I always recommend that uh, it's just a, a drop down in the report uh, comment that basically says, you know, that it really is important for somebody to verify that this is uh, grounded to the electrical system so that you don't have a fire hazard. So we're going to examine this water heater and we're going to start at the top and work our way down a little bit. Uh, the majority of the things we need to see on this are, are up above it anyway. Um, first thing you notice that this is a gas water heater and, and we already kind of talked a little bit before about this gas uh, venting system and how it's been shielded and so forth up there, which is fine. Um, I want you to notice that up top we have that blue tank, which is the thermal expansion tank. Um, now, if you're in a, a, an urban setting, um, for the most part, uh, you're going to need one of those thermal expansion tanks. Now, the exception would be if you were in a, dealing with a, a house that was on a well or you were out in the country somewhere. And the reason I say that is because the thermal expansion tank serves a very specific purpose, and that is this, that this water heater is gonna heat up, and we know that. So as this water heater uh, heats up, it expands. Before uh, 
thermal expansion tanks were ever needed, there was no check valve on your water system, which means that your water could not mix with your neighbor's water. It couldn't back up in the line under a change of pressure and mix with your neighbor's water. So basically, uh, what, what that means is that now that they have a check valve in there and your water can't back up into your neighbor's, the water has to go somewhere when, it, when heat expands it. So it expands into that thermal expansion tank, and that's what that tank is for, okay? So it's always a pretty safe bet to make sure that you call that out um, if it's not there. Uh, you'll notice we have a cold water line and we have a hot water line that come down and service this unit. Notice that the cold water line has a gate valve on it. That's a shut off valve, that's, that's required. This is your TPR valve, your temperature pressure relief valve. Um, I don't ever want you to mess with this valve, open it or anything. You don't, don't do that because if it opens and it sticks open and you got a leak there, you created it. So you don't want to, you don't want to play with that valve. Just notice that it's there. And the whole idea here is that if this water heater get too high, the temperature would get over 200 degrees or 260 degrees. Um, this thing could eventually explode and um, the temperature pressure relief valve releases that pressure so that that can't happen. The key to note about this uh, pressure relief valve is it can be CPVC piping or it can be copper like it is here. Uh, the key thing is it either goes and drains to the outside or if it were just uh, not going to the outside it could be it could be draining to the inside as long as it's no more than six inches above the floor because the idea being that if you don't have a drain line on this uh, or it's too high up you could get scalded if this thing ever were to uh, erupt while you were here you need to check for the label on the water heater because we need to identify the make of the unit the age of the unit and the capacity how many gallons it is so that label is on the water heater you need to find it and uh, sometimes it'll be very easy to determine uh, the manufacturer year. Sometimes it'll be a little bit of a challenge. So remember about www.building-center.org. Compare that uh, water heater serial number with the water heater serial numbers of the like manufacturer, and you should be able to determine what digits within that serial number represent the year. And uh, you want to try to do that because that makes your report thorough. Um, and then one last thing to mention to you about a water heater is, uh, you know, not to mess or, or uh, do anything with the thermostat, uh, which, which raises and lowers the temperature on the water heater. Your job is not to touch that. Uh, just just uh, don't, don't get in the habit of turning valves and things like that that are not frequently turned because very often they get rusty or they, they break and then you own them. So uh, you probably don't want to be owning a water heater. Uh, as a result of something you did on an inspection. Okay, so it's very important to try to identify where the main water shutoff is. The reason you want to be able to do that for your client is if they have a water leak, uh, they need to be able to know where to shut off the water to the house, where the main shutoff is. So uh, I try very hard to locate that. On this particular house, it happens to be sitting right here next to the water heater. And the reason I know I've found it is that uh, that the main water shutoff is usually within a couple of feet of the pressure reducing valve. This is it right here. And um, uh, you can see it's kind of a pear-shaped looking valve behind there. Uh, that's your pressure reducing valve. And that's what uh, takes the water uh, as a, uh, takes the water from street pressure, which is typically 140 PSI, pounds per square inch, down to something that your house can use, which is below 80 pounds per square inch. Within a couple of feet of that, you're gonna see the main shutoff, and this happens to be right here. This is your main shutoff. Do not operate this like any other valve. It could get rusty, could come off in your hand. So just note the fact of where it is, and uh, you'll notice it's, it's they typically are color-coded, blue for water. Um, so you'll know that that's, that's the one that's uh, right there uh, in the main, the main shutoff valve. I know there's one out at the street, but that's not really the main water shutoff valve. That's for the utility. That's not really for the homeowner because it needs a special key to operate it. So this one is really for the homeowner to use in, in the case of an emergency. So here we are at the electric panel and uh, part of our inspection requires us, uh, if, you're, if you're using the ASHI standards of practice, it requires you to take the panel cover off. The InterNACHI standards of practice do not require you to move the, the panel cover. We call this a dead front. 
But uh, I recommend that you know you can't do a, a, a thorough inspection without removing the panel because there are a lot of defects that we're going to find when we take this panel off that you want to be able to note in your report. So uh, the first thing I want you to understand though is we need to show some respect to electricity. Uh, I like to think that you know with plumbing you can make several errors uh, and you'll be okay. Maybe you get some water on the floor, uh, cause a leak. Electricity, you make one mistake and you may not get a chance to make another one. So let's just make sure we're very careful and safe. So the first thing I want you to do is when you approach the panel, since we haven't been here before, we want to make sure that we, we make sure this thing isn't energized. And the way to do that is to approach it with the back of our hand first. Um, if it's energized, our hand's going to come off like that. Um, if we approach it with our hand closed like this, uh, we're going to be in some trouble if that thing's energized and somebody's going to have to come peel you off this panel and that's not going to be a good thing for you. So um, we're going to do that. Uh, the next thing I want to just show you before we take the cover off is you'll notice this is the legend here. This just tells me what all these breakers are, uh, the, all these breakers go to. Now I know based on my own experience, because of the age of this house, I guarantee you that a lot of these are not accurate. But my job as a home inspector is not to determine the accuracy of what breaker goes with what appliance. That's not something you, within the scope of a home inspection. Just note whether or not it is the labels there, and there are, uh, there are breakers that are, are identified uh, in the panel. Okay, when I took the cover off, uh, note the screws that are being used to hold the dead front in place. You'll notice that these screws here are blunt screws, and then we have a, actually a sharp screw here that actually is not the type of screw you want to be using in this panel. You want to make sure the, the panel screws are blunt. Um, not a bad idea, actually, if you're on a home inspection. Go to Home Depot, buy, buy a few of these screws to carry around in your bag so that the screws are missing from the panel, or they have a wood screw in there, you can replace them with the proper screw. Just a suggestion, you don't have to do that. But um, you want to make sure, because these will puncture a wire, and if they puncture a wire, now you've created another problem that you don't want to have to, to deal with. Okay, we're going to start by examining this panel from the top to the bottom. So. First thing I want you to see is we've got some wires coming in here. I don't know what they're to, but the point of showing you this is that we really want a grommet or something to hold those wires in place. You'll notice that those wires are, are loose. If I were to jerk them really hard, I'd be able to move those wires uh, considerably, maybe even disconnect them from what they're connected to, which would cause an arcing situation and a possible fire. So we really want those grommets to be installed, and you'll just check around and you'll see that they're all... Uh, grommeted it. If they're not, just call it out. Um, as we come down here, I want you to see these are the two main service wires coming into the house. 120 leg, 120 leg. Um, this is the main breaker here. This is actually the neutral wire. And um, notice that we have 150 amp service. So the first thing you need to do is identify that we have 150 amp service. I want you to understand that we have uh, these are, these are uh, aluminum wires. This is a 2 odd aluminum wire, which is the proper size for this particular service. Um, as we come back down a little bit over here to the right of the panel, I want you to notice this is our neutral and, and our ground uh, bus bar. Um, only in a main panel can our grounds, which are the bare copper wires, and our neutral white wires, can they be on the same bus bar. In a sub-panel, which is anything downstream of this panel, uh, they would have to be isolated, meaning that the grounds would have to be on one bus bar, the neutrals would have to be on their own bus bar, and they could in no way be connected together. So this is okay that they're on the same bus bar. There is a problem here though, and the problem here is that we have uh, multiple white wires under the same screw. For example, uh, here, 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 um, and those wires uh, should be under their own individual screw. We call that a double tap. And anytime you have a double tap, more than one wire under the same screw or lug, um, that's considered to be an, a potential arcing situation. And uh, arcing means, you know, potential fire. So we want to make sure those are isolated from each other. Um, and so we would want them under a separate screw and we'd write that up. As we come a little bit further down the panel, I want you to understand this is where our service entrance basically ends and then this becomes all of our branch circuit wiring. So these are all the wires that service all the various areas of the house. They're all different sizes um, and that's okay. Everything's good with that. Um, I want to make sure uh, as I look at these wires, as these branch circuit wires, and I just want to make sure that we have one wire 
uh, per breaker. And you'll notice that we do uh, one wire per breaker up until we get here. Notice how we have two wires uh, to one breaker. That's a double tap, very similar to what we talked about up here. So that's a double tap. We'd want to call that out, okay? No more than one wire under a lug or a screw. Um, that's an arcing situation. Um, so uh, everything looks pretty good here. The, oh, the other thing I noticed about this is not only is this a double tap, but we have to make sure that our wire sizes are correct. So when we use a 15 amp breaker, we use a 14 gauge wire. When we use a uh, 20 amp breaker, uh, we use a 12 gauge wire. So notice that this wire is a 14 gauge wire being used on a 20 amp breaker, which is a, that's a fire hazard in and of itself because that wire will overheat potentially before that breaker would trip and uh, therefore we could have a fire. And you'll notice it's very subtle, but notice that this is a 14 gauge wire and compare it to this wire right above it, even though this wire is dirty, um, you can see that this wire is actually bigger than this wire. Um, and, and this wire here that it's, that it's doubled up with, you can see that that's the proper wire. And this is again, too small a wire for that application. Um, the next thing I want to point out to you is one of the things that you can do to avoid a double tap is they have a thing called a tandem breaker. These are tandem breakers right here. So you'll notice we have one, two, three tandem breakers. Um, what, what is the benefit of a tandem breaker? Well, uh, this tandem breaker only takes one slot on the bus bar. Notice how each of these breakers takes one slot. Well, this tandem breaker allows you to put two wires to one spot in the panel, so it saves space in the panel. So if your if you're service, for example, I can tell in this panel, they ran out of service, meaning that they didn't have enough room in this panel to connect all the circuits that they had, which is one of the reasons why they had that double tap there. But they, had a, they, they used these tandem breakers to help solve that problem, but they've still run out of space on this panel. Uh, and you can't put tandem breakers just anywhere. In fact, it's, this is going a little beyond a home inspection here, so I'm going to stop pretty quickly uh, before I get myself too deep into trouble. But um, if you were to look at the schematic for this panel, and I looked at it earlier and it doesn't say anything about it, probably because of the age of the panel, but um, if you looked at the schematic, it would actually show you where you're allowed to put a tandem breaker, because you can't just randomly put a tandem breaker anywhere. The problem is the only way you would be able to see that is either through the schematic, and you're not taking breakers out to tell. There is actually a, a notch in the breaker which shows you that that, or on the uh, bus bar, there's a notch that shows you that that's actually uh, meant for a tandem breaker, but you're not taking any of these things out of the panel, so you wouldn't know. So I'm just letting you know this for your own information. That this is how they deal with a double tap, and it's a perfectly acceptable way to do that, provided these are in uh, the designated spots they can be in uh, for, this, for this particular panel. Uh, the last thing I want to show you in this panel is if we come over here to the right side of the panel, I want you to see that we're, we're, we've got a, a neutral wire here that's being used as a hot wire. Um, and really, that shouldn't be the case. We ought to identify that white wire as being used as a hot. And to do that, somebody ought to put a piece of electrical tape over that, black, or use a black magic marker or a red magic marker, just so that the person downstream of that you know, knows too that it's not a neutral wire anymore. Um, neutral wires do carry current, okay? Um, uh, a lot of people don't realize that. They think that neutral wires are not hot. Well, they aren't hot wires, but they do carry current and they can shock you just as easily as a hot wire can. So anyway, we wanna make sure that's labeled. And then the other last thing that I wanted to show you in this panel was the overstripped wires on this side of the panel. Overstrip just means they've cut back the insulation a little too far on the wires and uh, it's exposing the copper. And that, uh, the theory there is if any of that copper were to touch another metal component, we could have an arcing situation and again, a fire hazard. So those should just be not cut back so far. Uh, and then the only, le only other thing I could think of that, uh, that I would call out in this panel is get rid of these breakers. These breakers were probably being used before they came up with these tandem breakers. And rather than throw them out, they just threw them in the bottom of the panel. So I like to clean up the panel that way. Okay, we're on the inside of the ha house at this point. Uh, we've already completed the exterior part of our inspection. Um, so where we're going to start the inside is we're going to start in the attic and work our way down. So uh, I'm here up in this attic. We had to pull downstairs. We'll make a couple of notes about that on our way down. 
that I want to share with you. But uh, up here in the attic, just uh, to give you a general idea of what I see up here, <clears throat> is I see a truss system, which means that these wood members were made in the factory and they basically are delivered to the job site uh, as opposed to dimensional lumber, which uh, you know typically is, is uh, uh, built at the site. This makes, uh, this makes it a lot more, uh, it just makes it simple for people to install it. Uh, you don't need it to be as trained, uh, as well trained to install this type of uh, construction. But most of the houses that you're gonna find today do have trusses. Uh, uh, and uh, everything up here looked pretty good. I didn't really see anything that was of major concern. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the insulation, but before we do, I just wanna make a note that they did have a fan at the very end of the attic here uh, that was uh, at the gable vent. <clears throat> and it's a power ventilator, and of course you can hear that. If you hear that, that uh, doesn't sound like a very smooth operating power ventilator to me, and that's pretty common. Power ventilators are, are terrible, basically. They don't really uh, last very long, and they make noises like that before they about ready to expire. Uh, best thing to do is, is to have a ridge vent, frankly. Ridge vents with soffit vents, and that's what we have on this house, actually. Um, you can't see it from this video, but uh, just understand that we have a ridge vent that runs completely across from one end of the ridge to the other, and that vent actually allows the air to come up from the soffits and circulate evenly among all the, the decking material and the wood members up in the attic, and then out through the ridge. Uh, so that's ideally the best type of venting. Um, if you have that type of vent, you don't need the other vents, like uh, you don't need a power ventilator, you don't need uh, other turtle back type vents uh, on, the, on the roof itself. You just have your, your, your uh, soffit vents and uh, your ridge vent. Um, <clears throat> okay, with that being said, we'll talk about the insulation next. As far as insulation in this particular attic, uh, we have, uh, this is called loose fill insulation. It comes in different colors, pink, white, yellow. Um, it's basically blown in, you know, it's not laid out in bats uh, on mats type of thing. It's, uh, it's just blown in and um, really the, the ideal for this type of insulation is going to be somewhere between, uh, you know, 11 and, and 14 inches thick depending on the R value we're trying to achieve. Um, most homes, at least in Georgia, uh, would, would be uh, R30 if you get up further north. Uh, they want our values of our 37 and, and higher. But here uh, we want, we're looking for insulation that's our uh, 30, which would mean 11 to 15 inches thick, somewhere in that area. You'll notice that we don't really have that here. Um, if I dig down in this insulation, I mean, I'm really, what's that in my hand? Six inches maybe? So, um, you know, we clearly don't have as much insulation. And what'll happen in an older house like this is insulation tends to get matted down, like you see here, it just, it doesn't, just typical over time, that's what happens to it. It gets matted down. So my recommendation here would be that they might want to add some additional supplemental insulation up here just to improve their energy efficiency. So um, really that's it in this attic. I don't see anything else that uh, is of any significance. One thing you do want to check for when you're, when you're in an attic is you just want to make sure you don't see any active water leaks. Uh, I didn't see any in this particular uh, structure. So um, like I said, everything looks good here. We'll make a couple of notes as we go down the ladder here on things I think you should know. But uh, other than that, we're going to move down to the uh, main uh, or the second floor of this house and uh, we'll, we'll pick it up right there. So we're coming back down this... Uh ladder, these attic stairs. And I just wanted you to be aware of a couple of things about these stairs. First of all, uh, we like to see some sort of insulation uh, in, these, in this portion of the stairs, just so that we are not losing treated air up into the attic, okay? So I just, small thing, but I call that out for, usually they'll take some bad insulation and just stuff it up in there. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you on this ladder is this ladder was not extending correctly. You'll notice here that that ladder is, is just not level where it hits the floor. And really what you need to do is they just need to cut that off so that this thing will be a little more secure when you're coming down this ladder. It's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit uncomfortable. You feel like you're going to fall. So uh, that just should be cut off and that'd be something I mentioned in the report as well. Okay, we've come down out of the attic and now we're ready to do the inspection on the second level. Um, before I get any further, though, there are a couple of things I want to point out to you. Number one, notice that I am wearing shoe protective, uh, 
gear here. Um, this is just a, a courtesy to the people who own this house, uh, especially if this home were uh, occupied and um, you know I were here, whether their owner's here or not, I would want to let them know they I want them to be able to see me that that I wear shoe covers to protect their carpet and their property. Okay, so I recommend that you go get yourself. Uh, you can buy them by the box. Um, don't go to Home Depot; you'll probably pay too much. But uh, find some find some shoe covers through Uline or one of those other outlets that can get you the uh, the shoe covers you need. Um, the next thing I want to tell you about about the inside is. Um, I guess you could say I created, you probably heard nursery rhymes when you were a kid. Well, my little nursery rhyme for the interior is as follows. Uh, ceilings, walls, floors, windows, outlets, doors. That's really what I'm inspecting uh, when I'm inspecting the interior. And if I remember that little nursery rhyme, uh, I won't miss anything. Uh, because it's very common to walk into a house and we're all accustomed to looking straight ahead. We're looking down so we don't trip. We're not normally looking around as a natural thing to be looking at people's ceilings. So as a home inspector, you need to get in the habit that not everything is straight ahead of you. A lot of it's up above you, to the sides, and down, okay? So if you keep that in mind, ceilings, walls, floors, windows, outlets, doors, I think you'll, you'll make sure that you hit on everything that you need to hit on. So first thing I'm gonna do in here is I would certainly look at the ceilings, the walls. I've already done that in this particular house and uh, everything looks pretty good. I don't see any issues with the walls or, or the ceilings. I don't see any evidence of leaks. Um, I would also, and I'll save this until the end, but I would also check all the light fixtures or ceiling fans that may be installed to make sure that they work. Um, and in this house, we don't have any flooring. Uh, we have subflooring that we can see here, but um, we don't have any finished flooring to look at. So, uh, as I mentioned to you, now that I've looked at the ceilings, walls, and the floors, now I wanna look at the windows, outlets, and doors. So uh, here's, a, here's a slider. This window is called a slider. Um, it's a vinyl window. I'm gonna to need to know that for my report, by the way, that this windows, these windows are vinyl, at least in this room. Um, they're also double pane windows. Um, double pane windows are obviously the window of choice now because of their insulating value, because you really have two panes of glass and you have a, an argon gas in between, which serves as your insulation. And uh, we do have double pane windows here. So I always wanna test the windows to make sure that they work. Oh, I don't think I unlocked that one. There we go. Perfectly acceptable. The next thing I try to do is with this window, everything looks good. I don't see any evidence of any window issues, fog into the glass or anything like that. Um, next thing I wanna do is check the outlets. I'm gonna check as many outlets as I can get to. If uh, I'm in a house that's occupied and there's something in front of an outlet and I can't get to it, I'm not gonna test that outlet. But the standards re require you to test a representative number of outlets. I don't think anyone knows exactly what representative means, but I try to make it every outlet I can get to. So here I'll test this outlet with my, I have a GFCI tester here. Interestingly enough, there's a lighting pattern here. And that lighting pattern basically on this particular outlet tells me that I have an open neutral, which means that either the neutral wire is not connected behind the wall there, or it could mean something else. And to be quite honest with you, I very rarely ever see that. I don't think I've ever seen it before, actually. Uh, and in fact, I've already pre-checked these outlets in the room. They're all showing me open neutral. So I'm simply going to write that up in my report that all of the outlets in the master bedroom are showing open neutral and recommend that an electrical contractor come and evaluate and repair as needed. I do know that the outlets in some of the other rooms are perfectly wired, no problem. So it seems to be isolated to this particular room. So we're gonna get an electrician to take, take a look at that. And when I say take, you're going to get an electrician, I mean the client is going to get an electrician to look at that. Your job is simply to report the defects. It's gonna be somebody else's job to actually engage another contractor to come out and do the, the rest of that. Um, all right, let's move to the bathroom. Uh, Almost forgot to show you the doors. 
Uh, that's why I have that nursery rhyme. You gotta keep track of it. Anyway, uh, what I do to test doors is very simple. Just check to make sure the doors latch correctly and if they fit into the frame correctly. If they were rubbing or they weren't latching correctly, again, I would write that up. Uh, but in this case, everything seems to be fine with these doors. So we'll move on to the vanity. Okay, we're looking here at the master bathroom. Um, we have a vanity here along with an outlet. We have a closet here. Uh, just uh, for your information, for whatever reason, and I don't know what it is, but uh, these lights, the light over the vanity and the light for the closet are not working. So again, those are things I would put in my report and those need to be investigated and repaired by a qualified electrical contractor. Um, if we go over here to the sink, I wanted just to, to see that this outlet right here is missing an outlet cover, of course. Um, so I'd want to write that up. That's a safety issue. But what I also wanted to show you was outlets around water, whether they be a, a bathroom vanity, whether they be a kitchen sink, um, those should be ground fault circuit interrupter protected. That's GFCI. And that basically, uh, to, make, in, to make it short and sweet, uh, that basically pre pre prevents you from getting shocked or electrocuted around water. Um, this outlet will actually trip, if it's a GFCI, will trip in 0.5 milliseconds, I believe it is, uh, which is a lot faster than the current can get to you. So that's why we have these, and that's why we call them out to be upgraded. I don't care when the home was built. Uh, that's just a safety enhancement that you ought to think about. So I know in this particular house, because it was built in 1982, uh, they were required uh, in bathrooms. They weren't required in kitchens at that point, but in bathrooms they were. So this should be a GFCI outlet. And how I test it is, I put my tester in there, and you'll notice when I do, I actually show that this, this is getting power, which is fine. Now to test if it's a GFCI, I press this red button on the top. That simulates a ground fault. So basically when I hit that red button, it ought to kill the power to this outlet. And it did. So I know that this is GFCI protected. That's good. Now what I have to do is, I have to figure out where this GFCI is what it's connected to because there's either, this is either, because this doesn't have push buttons on it, it's either connected to an outlet that does have push buttons on it, or it could be wired straight to the panel. Now we've already looked at the electric panel and I saw no uh, GFCIs uh, at all in the electric panel, which is fine. That just tells me that it's gotta be somewhere else. And I happen to know just from being in this house before that this particular GFCI is actually connected to the push button GFCI that was located in the utility room where we were in the garage, where the, air, where the uh, furnace and water heater were. So I'll have to go down there to reset this and get this working correctly. That's something that's very important that you point out to your buyer. Uh, I do that when I do the walkthrough at the very end with my buyer so that they know if they trip this, they're not calling an electrical contractor uh, who's gonna charge them a hundred some odd dollars to come out to the house when he probably knows exactly what's wrong, he'll just go down and press that button on the uh, counterpart to this and this will start working again. Now the next thing we're gonna look at is the vanity. And we just wanna make sure that our plumbing connections are proper, that our hot and cold water are not reversed. Uh, so I go over and I just turn them on and let them run for a couple of minutes. Uh, check the, the drain to make sure it's working correctly. Uh, and while the water's running, I'll open the cabinet here and basically all I want to do underneath here is just make sure what kind of plumbing do I have. I see I have copper. Um, I also have copper uh, connects for my, uh, all the way up through to my fixtures. Uh, those are where the shutoff valves are. And um, everything looks good under there. I don't see any leaks or anything, any concern there. The other thing I want to do is then turn the cold water off. And then I want to just let the hot water get to temperature and then you can either, either use a laser thermometer that you can get at Home Depot. I happen to have an infrared camera, but I'm gonna measure the temperature of the water because if it's over 120 degrees, which I find it is many times, that's scalding and uh, that could scald somebody. So obviously that's a safety issue and something you'd wanna call out. So all you do is you simply shoot the water, get the temperature off of that and, um, and record it if it's too high. A lot of times also the hot and cold water will be reversed. I won't say a lot, but it happens from time to time. So just make sure that the hot's hot, the cold's cold, and those things are hooked up correctly. 
Um, I noticed that uh, we have a couple of light switches that don't work. Um, and so I'm gonna be writing those up as well. Uh, our next uh, stop is gonna be the water closet where we, uh, we don't have any fan, ceiling fan that works in there. The overhead light doesn't work in there either. So those are things that I'm going to definitely wanna call out in my report. But we'll go to the water closet next. Okay, so we're in the uh, spare bathroom upstairs, and uh, just for the heck of it, I wanted to check the water temperature. I didn't do that before at the other bathroom. And notice that uh, it's 134 degrees, so we're well above scalding. So I would need to call that out on my home inspection. Um, that's usually the best way just to test for it there. Uh, okay, with that being said, uh, also in this bathroom, I just wanted to show you, we have an outlet here. Of course, that doesn't have an outlet cover, it's missing. Um, my suspicion is that this outlet is connected to the one in the master, which is also connected to another GFCI, the one with the push buttons, which is actually located down in that utility room I was telling you about. So we put this in and voila, it doesn't work. Um, I've already reset that other outlet, so I know that uh, this outlet is just faulty for whatever reason, and this needs to be, uh, evaluated and repaired by a qualified contractor. Um, as we look under this sink, uh, same thing, just looking for leaks and that type of thing. I don't see anything that was of any major issue there. And then really the last thing in this bathroom that you just need to be aware of is we wanna make sure that the toilets are securely bolted to the floor. This particular toilet actually moves. You can see that that toilet is not secured to the floor. And uh, normally how I test those is, we're in a little tight space here, but normally I would straddle that toilet with my knees and then I would just try to rock it. And if it rocks, I wanna call that out because uh, you wanna make sure that toilet is, is secured to the floor. Um, other than that, in this bathroom, uh, we check the shower connections. We'd also check the tub to make sure everything's caulked. It all looks pretty good. So um, we're ready to move on to our next room. Oftentimes you're gonna go into a, uh, a bedroom or whatever, any kind of room really. And uh, you'll be testing the outlets and you'll notice that you test an outlet like this one over here and you'll see that it's not working. And you'll go, hmm, I'm gonna write that up as a bad outlet. Well, before you do that, uh, make sure that you check the walls because a lot of times there'll be a wall switch. And if you'll notice this wall switch, if I turn it on, it actually controls that outlet there. So if somebody had a, uh, you know, a lamp or whatever, um, floor lamp, they could put it in here. So just wanna make sure those, those are things that'll kind of stump you from time to time. And I just don't want you to get stumped. Okay, we have a couple of other bedrooms to check on this level, but we're not gonna do that for the purposes of this video. Just understand that all bedrooms will be treated just the same way as we treated the master. Um, and we'll be checking for all the same things. Remember, ceilings, walls, floors, windows, outlets, and doors, okay, in every room. Now that we're done with this level, uh, the last thing we wanna do is we wanna check the temperature. Remember we had put this on heat when we first got here because it was a little cooler outside. So we just wanted to go ahead and run it in heat mode and see how well that was gonna do. So what I'm gonna do now is I wanna check all of the registers, all of the supply registers throughout the home to make sure that they're all connected properly and they're all giving me heat. So I'm gonna do this one here in this bedroom first and we'll start by going down to the floor. And as you can see, this is 121 degrees coming out of the register, which is actually a good reading. Um, anywhere between, you know, with a regular furnace like we have in this house, anything really over 110 up to 145 or 50 is fine. So we have 122 here. As long as we have a similar temperature at all the other registers, we're good to go. Okay, so uh, this is our fireplace in the family room. And uh, one of the things that uh, you should do as a home inspector is you should make every attempt to light the fireplace if it has a gas burner, just to make sure that it's working properly. Um, we're gonna be doing a couple of other things uh, in a moment as far as the inspection goes. But what I want you to understand here is we have gas logs. And uh, that's fine, nothing wrong with gas logs as opposed to uh, wood, wood burning logs. Uh, just keep in mind that gas logs are combustible, so they too must uh, have a venting uh, mechanism. And in this case, we have a flue, which is, which is good. Um, and so uh, when we test the fireplace, we do wanna make sure that the flue is open. Uh, on this particular fireplace, the actual damper is up inside the unit. And uh, we can't, uh, you know, I can't reach it for you right this minute, but just understand that it's there. 
you do need to test that to make sure that the damper works correctly. And then you want to test the, the fireplace and make sure that it is working. So you want to be careful when you do this. So you just gradually, we have a gas key over here. We're going to gradually just turn the gas on and use a long lighter, I recommend. And uh, you'll see that as we... And we have a nice flame. So I want to just test that to make sure that it's working. Um, something you need to be aware of uh, about this is I mentioned to you that uh, we have combustible gases that need to be vented. With gas logs, the problem with that is if that flue's not open, I have no way of knowing that. So if I live here and I'm having a fire, unless I visually get underneath and see that that flue is open, I could literally gas myself by not having an open flue running this fireplace and the carbon monoxide would overtake me. So that flue actually has to have a damper clamp installed on it and that damper clamp keeps that flue open 10% to allow those combustible gases to escape so you don't become asphyxiated. Okay, so we've talked about the uh, damper clamp. Now what I want you to do is understand that part of the inspection entails actually looking at the firebox. So in this case, we're looking basically to see that there, there aren't any cracks uh, because chimney fires are a, a major problem in this country uh, and it's caused by cracks in the fireplace and, and allow, uh, firebox and allowing uh, you know, the flames to, uh, to ignite from there. So you can see here we have this metal firebox and uh, it looks to be in pretty good shape. Uh, so I don't see anything uh, wrong with that. The last thing that I want to point out is uh, this gas line right here. Uh, this gas line, as you can see, it's not completely sealed. And that gas line ought to be sealed. There is a non-combustible sealer for that. You need to make sure that it's a non-combustible sealer. Uh, but you'd want to call that out in your report because, again, that's a, that's a safety issue where a flame could, uh, you know, could ignite something behind the firebox and now all of a sudden you have a, you have a fire. Okay, before we leave the living room, one other thing I wanted to mention to you is the stairs that were leading up to the bedrooms. A couple of things. In 1982, it was permissible to have an open uh, handrail here. Uh, that's really no longer uh, allowed. And uh, again, we're not, we're not doing code inspection here, but uh, by the same token, um, it is something that I would call out on a home inspection. And that is that this railing should actually terminate with the wall. And the thought process behind that is uh, without that, if I'm running by here, if I'm a woman with a purse, I could grab it and snag it on here, or even my clothing I could snag on there, and that would be a safety issue. So just want you to be aware of that, and I would just call it out as an improvement maybe in my report. The other thing I want you to be aware of is when we, when we deal with a three-way switch. So here's what a three-way switch basically is. You'll notice how I have a switch here. It controls the light at the top of the stairs, okay? There's also another light switch up there at the top of the stairs that controls the same light. You're gonna find in a lot of inspections that three-way switches are not wired correctly, which means I can control this from here just fine, but if this isn't in the on position and I try to control it with that light switch up there, let's just say this light's off, I try to control that by turning that light on, it's not gonna illuminate the fixture. That's just an improperly wired three-way switch and you should definitely call that out because you can clearly see that would be a safety issue for someone who's trying to come down the stairs and they can't get any light in the, in the hallway there. So uh, with that being said, let's move on to another uh, railing issue. Okay, so before we go down to the lowest level in this house, uh, one other thing I wanted to point out to you is um, this railing here. Um, under current standards, and I think I mentioned this to you outside as well when we were talking about the deck, is that we really don't want any more than four inches in between these pickets. Now, back in 1982, they had no uh, codes or standards against that, so they were perfectly allowable. That doesn't necessarily make it right. So again, being the inspector, I would go ahead and just call this out for what it is, uh, that these pickets are too far apart, and a child could fall down, and that would be pretty devastating to a small child, even though it's only a few feet. Okay, so uh, in addition to the openings, uh, which you see here, which are, we've already talked about that being too, too open. Um, the other thing is this handrail. Um, you know, this is not a comp compliable handrail by today's standards. Uh, this would need to be 
uh, graspable. They don't consider this a graspable handrail. Um, so anyway, I would just write it up. Whether they do anything about it or not, it's uh, probably unlikely that they will. But um, again, that's not your job. Your job is to uh, point out the defects, report the news. Um, what they do with the news is up to them, but uh, it's important for you to call it out and let them decide what they want to do with it. Okay, we're in the, uh, uh, I guess you would call it powder room. Uh, this room doesn't have a shower or anything, so we call it a powder room. This is on the very lowest level of the house. And uh, one of the things that first uh, uh, became apparent to me when I walked in here is that there's no outlet in here. So I would write that up. Uh, while it's not a, quote, defect, uh, I guess you could have it at bathroom without an outlet. Um, I recommend that there is one because people do have things they need to plug in, whether it be a hairdryer or whatever. So um, I would recommend that. Uh, the next thing I wanted to show you in here was that this toilet, uh, like the one that we had earlier, this toilet actually rocks a little bit. And you can see that I can move it between my legs, which just tells me it needs to be more securely bolted to the floor. So you can see this discoloration in the floor. And uh, that typically tells me there has been a moisture problem or there is a moisture problem. So here I have my, uh, my moisture meter and I'm going to go ahead and insert it into the wood. And you can see that I'm getting a reading of somewhere around 20%, 18 to 20%. That's a little higher than I would typically want to see. Uh, you know, everything retains a little bit of moisture, so 10 or 12% is pretty common. So I wouldn't write that up, but with, with, with 18%, 16, 18%, just to play it safe, I'd write this up. Somebody else needs to come in, further evaluate, make sure we don't have a, a, an ongoing leak somewhere in the floor. Okay, so here we are in the laundry room. Just a couple of things that I'd like to point out to you real quickly that you ought to be thinking about when you're doing your inspection. Um, the first thing is that that's the dryer vent right there. Uh, in here, it looks fine. That's going to connect to our dryer. Uh, these are our supply lines for our, uh, wash, uh, for our washing machine. And there's the standpipe there for the wastewater. Um, a couple of things I'd like to point out to you here. We Notice we have this pan um, that sits underneath the uh, washing machine. And that's an overflow pan. And the whole idea behind that is that uh, if the washing machine were to overflow, that the water would, would go from that pan. But as you can probably imagine, that pan isn't going to hold all the water from the washing machine. So it needs, this washing machine pan needs to be drained to the outside. If it's not, it's going to flood and, and we're going to ruin these hardwood floors in the house. So really, I would recommend that this, this pan be connected to a dedicated drain line to drain somewhere other than obviously inside the house. So this is our outlet, 240 outlet for our dryer. Note that um, we don't have a gas line in here, which means that if these people have a gas line, uh, uh, dryer and they're moving in here, um, they're either going to need to get the gas line run or they're going to need to swap out for an electric dryer. So this is our electric dryer outlet. Notice that it's a three-prong outlet, but you'll note that my three-prong tester doesn't work very well in that outlet. So I need to use a special uh, tester, which basically allows me just to check the two hots. And if I do that, you'll see that that illuminates, telling me that uh, that that outlet is working. In 1996, the three-prong outlets uh, were basically outdated by uh, the code, and the code required that, um, that, that the outlets be four-prong outlet. The reason for that is, in this configuration that we have here, we have two hots and we have a neutral. The neutral is also serving as the ground, uh, and that's really not the safest way to do it. Uh, that's why they changed the code to a four-prong outlet. Uh, the four-prong outlet, we have two hots, a neutral, and a dedicated ground, uh, making, the, making it a safer situation. So I just call that out as an improvement uh, because you will find a lot of houses that were specially built in this era that uh, are going to have the three-prong outlet. The other thing to keep in mind is that appliances today, most of them are going to come with a four-prong um, plug. So if you have a three-prong outlet, you're going to probably have to either change the outlet or you're going to have to change the cord on the appliance to make sure that it matches up. All right, so uh, we're wrapping things up on the interior in the kitchen. And um, there's some things you just need to know when you're testing uh, for things in the kitchen that uh, I want you to be familiar with. So the first thing I want to do when I come into the kitchen is I want to make sure that uh, my appliances work, okay? And I've already tried earlier to work this dishwasher, as I mentioned to you at the very beginning of this video, 
we checked the dishwasher. Unfortunately, it wasn't working at the time, so I'd write that up. Uh, it just wasn't coming on. So uh, that's something that you need to write up. Um, the other thing I'd test, of course, is the, uh, the range and uh, the overhead vent. Now, as I look at this, what I'd do is I'd turn the burners on just to make sure that the burners are working. And I'd also turn the oven itself on. I want to check and make sure, you know, sometimes with a new oven, you never know if there's packaging material or whatever in there. Uh, you want to make sure that, that the homeowner doesn't store certain items in there that you would be testing and maybe burn up. Uh, but as long as it's clear, then what I want to do is I want to, I want to set this uh, oven to bake. And uh, I'm setting it to 350, and while I'm doing that, I'm checking these burners. All these burners seem to work fine, so I can turn those off now. Uh, I'm going to wait just a second to make sure this oven gets up to temperature. Now, this is electric, obviously, so um, I'm going to give it just a second. This is the overhead uh, vent for it. You'll notice that we have the light switch. That works. This is for the fan. The fan seems to operate. Now, what I do need to check for with the fan is to see how is it vented. Well, if I look up here, huh, okay. Well, you can see that this is venting to the exterior of the house, which is fine. The only problem is it's not connected. So I would want to make sure that uh, they know that they have to connect this vent uh, to make it work properly. But it's vented to the exterior, which is, which is okay. Um, the other thing I want to check for on the range um, is we call it an anti-tip bracket. It's a safety feature to prevent injury to small children. You'll see what I mean when I try to rock this forward. You see how it rocks forward here? What that's telling me is the bracket is not installed. The thought process is if a child opened this door and stood on that door, this whole unit would come over crashing on them. So that's why it's very important to have that safety bracket. That's a safety issue, I'd write it up as such. You can see that the oven's on. You notice how I don't check the temperature? I have it set for 350, but I'm not checking the temperature here. I just want to check to make sure it's working. That's all I want to do. It is working, so now I want to make sure I turn it off. And let me tell you, very important point that I'm giving you right now, make sure you turn the range off. Somebody is not going to be happy with you if they come home to their house and their, their range is at 350 and has been all day. Uh, they're going to at least want to think that you baked them some cookies, right? So anyway. Uh, the other thing I want you to see in the kitchen, we'll check obviously the, the fixtures to make sure the, that the water, hot and cold, are working, that our sprayer is working properly, that we don't have any leaks under the sink. I, I see here we have an opening under the sink, which you maybe can't see here, that's okay. Just understand that there really shouldn't be any openings under a sink, those all should be sealed. Uh, the plumbing looks otherwise good under there, I don't see any water leaks. And then we'll check the garbage disposal. Oh, which uh, obviously is uh, in trouble. So we'd want to make sure that we write that up. Uh, probably the second to last thing we're going to check in this kitchen is we're going to check to make sure that these outlets are GFCI protected, ground fault circuit interrupter. Remember what I told you very first part of the video? I said, you know, when you come to a house like this, it was built in 1982. It's kind of nice to know that because I know that when I'm coming into a kitchen like this, chances are, unless this house has been remodeled at some point uh, in its history, that uh, these outlets were not required. GFCIs were not required in the kitchen. So I go to test them, and sure enough, as I go to test these, you'll notice I hit my test button, and none of these outlets, I've already tested them, none of these outlets uh, is GFCI uh, protected, which is a, a, a safety issue that I'd want to write up in my report. Even an outlet to the right of a range should be GFCI protected. It wasn't always that way. In fact, you'll inspect homes in the 90s where these outlets, because they're within a six feet proximity to the water, uh, they're all GFCI protected. But you'll see an outlet over here next to a range and it won't be. Well, I always recommend that these be uh, also GFCI protected. Why? Because you're, you're working with water, boiling water on a range and so forth, so you're near water. Um, and that's what the whole idea is to, to protect yourself. Uh, lastly, in the kitchen, I do want to check all the cabinets. I want to make sure all these cabinet doors work correctly because you know what's going to be the problem? Is if somebody moves into a house and all of a sudden, you know, they open a cabinet and it comes off in their hand. 
they're going to be wondering, what was the home inspector thinking when he came through my kitchen? So we just want to check all these to make sure that they're, that they're functional, the drawers to make sure they're all functional. In this particular house, they are. So with that being said, I've checked my oven, it's off. Uh, I think we're done in the kitchen, so we're really getting down to the home stretch of this inspection. Okay, so you remember those upstairs bathrooms that we talked about earlier? Well, we know the master, uh, we, we tripped it, and uh, we needed to reset that. Well, in a house that was built in this time frame, 1982, it was not uncommon for the control for that to be located in the garage. I call it the mother outlet, the one that controls it. So it's the push button outlet, and it happens to be in this utility room that we were in earlier off the garage. And as you can see here, um, if I plug my tester in here, my tester isn't going to work because we already tripped it from upstairs. So the only way that I can reset this is there's a button on here, and it's kind of hard to see because it's been painted over. But if I push that button in, that's all I needed to do to reset that. So now that outlet will work up in the master, and we, we don't know about that second bathroom upstairs. We know there's an outlet problem there, but that's probably connected to this as well, and it's just something wrong with the outlet. But um, you'll notice now when I plug this in that it is illuminated, so everything is restored. That's why you need to take your client through the house and show them things like this, because what's going to happen is if you don't, they're going to have that problem when they move in, they're going to call an electrician because they don't know this. And they'll call an electrician who will gladly come out for a couple hundred dollars, which you can save them and you can be the hero. So I recommend you do that on your inspections. Okay, so the last thing we need to do now as part of our inside interior inspection is we need to check the air conditioning system in cooling mode. Remember, we already checked it in heat mode and everything looked fine. We checked it at all registers. So now what I need to do in cooling mode is I only have to check it at one register to get that temperature um, because I've already checked it in, in heat mode at all the other registers. So I know they haven't changed the ductwork since I checked it in heat mode. So I only need to check one. So I come here and I have this register here. So I, I shine my, uh, my infrared camera here and you can see the temperature is 51, 52 degrees. Uh, the closer you can get to that, the better, uh, because you want an accurate reading. So I have 53 degrees there. Now in cooling mode, what I do differently than when I was in heat mode, is I'm checking to see the differential between the supply, which we just checked, and the return. Now there happens to be a return right here. So we're gonna check the return, and the return says 64 degrees. So that means the air going back into the system is at 64 coming into the house at 52, do I have 15 to 20 degrees? Well, I don't have 15 to 20 degrees. I have more like 12 degrees. Let me try this one more time. So I come back here. This is more like, I'm getting a little bit of a fluctuation, but it's actually gotten to 49. So we're gonna say 50. And then I come back over here again and I said, 64.6, it's 14 degrees, close enough. Um, as long as it's somewhere around 15 to 20 degree differential, uh, I know that the air conditioning system is working properly. If it weren't getting that, if we we're only getting 10, then I would definitely, we might have a problem with the uh, air conditioning system. It may lack Freon, uh, but that's going to be up to an HVAC uh, specialist to, to diagnose and fix. All we want to do is, is check the differential and report on what we see. As part of the inspection, you should also note the absence of smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors. The National Fire Protection Association recommends smoke alarms be replaced every 10 years and that they be located inside every bedroom and at least one be located on every level of the home. At least one carbon monoxide detector is recommended per floor. Now I know a lot of you, when you decided to make home inspection a career, you probably thought about, gee, I hate to be up on roofs. Well, you know what? I spent 14 years going up on roofs and uh, it's greatly overrated. And um, I've hurt myself in other ways on a roof and it's not worth it. So I discovered that the best thing to do in a home inspection is to be able to do two things. One, get to the eave, and we'll be doing that in a minute. Just getting a ladder up to the eave so you can kind of get to a shingle 
a set of shingles and you can kind of do a flexibility test to kind of get a general idea of the age of the shingle and how it's wearing. But the majority of your inspection, quite frankly, is better done using the latest technology, which is really a drone. And trust me, while a drone may seem expensive, uh, you want to make sure, A, that you get one with a 4K camera. Uh, you want good quality photos. Uh, but, you know, the cost uh, and the payback uh, when you amortize it over your career is, is pennies per home inspection. I mean, uh, it really is. So uh, anyway, we're going to inspect this roof using a drone. And so um, it's really not important what brand of drone you have. It's just important that you have a drone you're comfortable with. It's in your budget. And like I said, if it has a 4K camera, I'd recommend that strongly. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take this drone up in the air. So my particular drone, the way it flies is it like a video game. Uh, we're just going to take it up in the air. And as you can see here, I like to tell people the beauty of a drone is I get 100% coverage of my roof. And I just use it through my phone and my control panel here on my drone. I get some excellent pictures and uh, I can do a roof inspection in about 15 minutes tops. Uh, with trees around, it's a little more difficult to navigate. It might take me a little bit longer, but this gives you a really good idea of how the drone works. And then, of course, when I'm, when I'm finished, I just bring it home. Okay, so let me uh, mention a couple of things about ladder safety if you're going to use a ladder. And I do recommend you use a ladder to get to the eave. So pick a point on the house, the lowest, really the lowest spot that you can get to and still see the shingles. On this particular house, we're in the backyard, and uh, boy, we don't have very, very high to go on this house at all. Uh, but what I wanted to show you with the ladder is uh, you want to make sure that you use proper safety technique with the ladder. So a couple of quick things about a ladder is number one, you want to really, as you're standing straight to the ladder and your arms fully extended, this would be the correct pitch for this ladder. Okay, notice that the ladder's uh, angled enough so that this ladder isn't going to come back on me if I get up there. Notice also that I've only got a little bit of clearance up top. I really need to have three feet extension above the roof line. So what I'm going to do is, this is like a little giant knockoff ladder. What I can do with this ladder is I can extend it some more, just from here. And now you'll see I have plenty of clearance above the roof line. And again, I have the proper stance. So now I can climb this ladder safely and um, I'll see you at the top. Okay, so here I am at the eave. Um, I don't go any further than this. This is it for me. This is as high as I get. I get a good view of the shingles here that we have. We've got uh, an architectural shingle here. Uh, it looks like they've got more than one layer of shingles on this house, which is never really a great idea. Uh, you really only want uh, one layer of shingles, at the most two. Uh, the structure really can't handle any more than that. So uh, only two layers of shingles. But uh, what I do is I try to do a flexibility test of the shingle where I can find the shingle. Uh, I try to, to uh, bend it just to see, you know, what the flexibility is. This shingle right here, I, I can tell that these shingles are probably... This is a 30-year shingle, but it's probably well over half of its life. And maybe part of the reason it's over half of its life is this, uh, this, this roof is never going to last as long as the original roof underneath it. Um, when you layer a shingle on top of it, it just reduces the life. So uh, these shingles are, are a little bit uh, more worn than I would have thought from the ground. But uh, uh, again, you want to make sure that you report to your client that you think this roof is about 50% of the way uh, through its life. Well, that wraps up this home inspection. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I do want to make a couple of footnotes for you. And one is to let you know that this was certainly not an all-inclusive home inspection. Um, we did hit on the key points, but um, you know, there's a lot to learn. I think you hit the main, uh, you got the main points here, uh, but you got to continue to learn uh, your craft. So I would also encourage you strongly to do some mock inspections where you actually go out and inspect your your friend's home, your relative's home, uh, maybe offer to give them a free report, uh, just so that you can get experience and build your confidence level, because that's what this is all about. It's all about confidence. Um, 
The other thing I would mention to you is, uh, you know, try to catch more of our videos as we as we release them, because we're going to talk more about report writing, um, how to take all this information, for example, that we learned today and condense it into a meaningful and understandable report to your client, because that is part of what you have to do as a home inspector. Um, so anyway, until we see you again, thanks a lot for joining us on this home inspection, and we'll see you real soon.